Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Abby, also known as Stacey Mormon on the forums, and welcome to the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes podcast. Um, I'm joined today by... This is Adamus, also known as Drown Snow on the forums. That was weird, man. <laughs> Hi, this is Glenn Dyko Stripers from the forums. This is Katie Lady Griffin on the forums. This is Kevin. Don't call Kevin on the forums. This is Brett White Raven on the forums. This is Zach Alias on the forums. Um, and before we begin, this podcast will contain spoilers for all works in the Hunger Games series, including the movies. So yeah, is everybody ready to begin? Because we will. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. So I, I will just say that you'll be surprised when you when you're editing. It's like everything you can just get rid of all of that. Everything's perfect. yeah. No, I've I've edited beginning always is the worst. Before. Yeah, I'd keep it. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so before we like talk about the prequel, I just thought we could um, just talk about like when we last visited this series because I think it's been like ten years or something since the last book was released, and like five or six years since the last movie came out. And also, just um, like how old were you when you got into this series? Just because it is a uh, young adult fiction, so I think that might be interesting. How dare um, you? I guess I'll start because yeah. So um, I usually reread Catching Fire every couple of years because I really like it for some reason and I own it and whatever. And um, I'm reading the books again in French right now, actually. So it's been very recent since I last visited this series. Um, and I was 11 when I first read the books. Um, I read them three years after they came out because I was nine when they came out because I'm a baby. <laughs> you said you own it. Do you not own the rest? Um, yeah, so I only own a physical copy. Well, now I own them in French. But yeah, I only owned Catching Fire and then I like would just get the other ones from the library. I mean, that's a weird brag, but cool. No, it's because it. <laughs> I mean, the where I work, they have like a one of those like take a book, leave a book, and someone like had Catching Fire, and I was like, I mean, I'll just take it. Like, it's my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I, I, I never left a book. <laughs> and I'll... oh my god, now there's evidence. You better edit that out. You're in <laughs> trouble. Will find you. Be a pariah. Well, you know, I guess I'm here. Um, I got into Hunger Games or read them initially, I guess maybe like 2013 or 14, somewhere in there. Um, was dating a girl that really liked young adult fiction, and she just kind of conned me into reading them because she was, and I enjoyed them fine. I liked the, I liked the world well enough, but I was around 25 at the time. Cool. I guess. I like that. How many years ago was that, Kevin? Uh, 2014, 13, <laughs> something. Okay. I don't know. I'm 31 now, so. And is that, like, the last time you revisited the series, or, like... You know, I reread them maybe a couple of years later, but maybe... Were you still together, know. or were you the new person? Well, I, well, not with the new person, but... But... um. No, we were not together at that point. Oh, do you want to have it from like a fresh point of view without her around? Yeah, I didn't want to, you know, associate Katniss with her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I'll go next. I first read these when I was in, I think, a senior in college. Um, I haven't reread them in, since then. Uh, but I watched the movies for the first time uh, a couple of weeks ago. And really, I think I enjoyed those movies better than the books, almost. I found them very digestible. My brain was off the entire time. Um, <laughs> they're just, yeah, they were fun. I wasn't expect. I, I was actually not thinking that I would enjoy them, but they were surprisingly entertaining blockbusters, especially Catching Fire. I think that was the best one. Yeah, I remember seeing um, Mockingjay Part 2 in theaters. I was on a date, and my date had broken his back, so he had, like, a, a, like a thing, and he was just, like like un it like halfway through the movie and it was the most embarrassing thing in my life because it was so loud. <laughs> Abby, you <laughs> have the like, best Ooh. stories always. <laughs> Just say. How old was your date that he had a broken back? Um, he was a senior in high school. He fell off a mountain <laughs> while he was um, like rock climbing or something. Did he fall off a mountain or fall down a mountain? Fall down a mountain, yeah. His friends baked him a cake that said, sorry about your back. 
<laughs> Katniss, we have to sneak through this part of the city. <sighs> yeah. He's fine now. He's fine now, but um <laughs> well, good for him. <laughs> yeah. I haven't talked to him in a few years, but <laughs> Um, so for me, I, I honestly can't remember the first time I read these books. Um, I think it was probably like 2010 because I know I read them before the movies were out, but I, I don't think right when they were published, um, or at least when the, um, the first one was published. So I, I really loved these books when I read them back then. I must've been like, what, like 15, 14, 15 when I read it. Um, and it was In the wheelhouse. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, and yeah, they, they quickly became like one of my favorite pieces of like this kind of like young adult fiction. And I've probably read them six or seven times since then, uh, including I read all of them a couple weeks ago before this new book was coming out. So, yeah, I, I really like them a lot, especially the first book. So that's where I'm coming from. Well, it was back in 2010. I read them. I had just finished um, a work placement and... It was maybe a few months before I was going back to my final year at university. So I was 21 at the time. Um, and, you know, tons of time. So I was watching a lot of YouTube videos. Um, I watched this series on YouTube called Alex Reads Twilight. So a blogger that read um, each chapter of Twilight and talked about it, but also mocked it. No offense to anyone that's read Twilight, but I've never read them myself. But um, you have horrible taste, is what you're saying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, during, like, midway between, it was probably, like, um, the tenth chapter, somewhere in the middle um, of Twilight, he did a Q&A session for people listening, and he was like, you know, I'm getting a lot of questions, right, Alex, you're saying this, this book is horrible, what should we be reading, what would you recommend? And one of the books was The Hunger Games, so that, you know, I went away and read into it, what it was all about, and I thought, oh, that actually sounds really good. Um, so went into um, Glasgow one day, went to Waterstones to buy it, um, read it in maybe two days, loved it. Um, since then, I've read it about eight times, so really, really enjoy it, really find it rereadable. Um, and when I read this, uh, the first book, um, I think it was maybe a few days later, I thought, I wonder if I was reading that it's a trilogy. The third book had not been released yet, but the second book was out. And I thought, hmm, instead of buying it, I wonder if it's in the library. So when got it, read that. And then it was maybe the, the next week Mockingjay was released. So I went to buy that and read that. Um, and I've read all the books multiple times. Um, watched watched the movies, all the movies in the cinema, have them all on DVD, so I really loved the series. Right before the first movie came out, a friend of mine told me I should read the books, so I read the first one, thought it was really good. Read the second two, I didn't think they were quite as good, but I haven't read them since. I watched all the movies, they're, they're okay. And that's my story. Yeah, I, I think it was kind of the same for me. Um, I mean, I saw, like, the movies were getting made and they were like, this is going to be the next Harry Potter. Cause like everything was the next Harry Potter at the time. And so I was like, well, let me, let me, you know, check these books out. So I did the, the audio books while I was at work and I was like, okay, I dig these. I watched the movies in the theater. And then, um, I didn't even realize that this book was coming out until you guys had mentioned that you were reading it. But, uh, I got them. I think I got the DVDs or the like digital movies, maybe like a month ago and was watching through them. So I finished watching um, Mockingjay like last week, but I hadn't watched them since the theater. Yeah, I also didn't realize this book was coming out until someone mentioned it on another call I was on. So I feel like there was not a lot of that talk about me. it. Oh, yeah. It, it was kind of <laughs> like a secret. This book was a secret, <laughs> I guess. There's a lot going on this year. Audible forced it upon me. It was like, hey, look, you should read this. I was like, all right. All right. So, um, Suzanne Collins doesn't work her way into my Twitter timeline like other, like other authors seem to find a way to do. Well, well <laughs> looking at the, the publishing order, too, for some reason I thought Mockingjay wasn't finished when they started the movies, but I guess they were all finished. So, hmm. Yeah, I read them all yeah, before the first movie came out. Before. 
Yeah, I think I read yeah. them all before the first movie came out too. Or like, I think I, I definitely read Hunger Games and Catching Fire before the first movie came out. But I was yeah. really young when I read Mockingjay because I did not understand what was going on when I was reading Mockingjay. I was like, how, how was this a war? And then I like reread it a couple years later. And I, mean, I, like, I still oh, don't that. really understand what's going on in that book. Yeah, there are definitely issues there. Yeah. But like also I think I was like 12. So I was like, what is happening? <laughs> Um, okay, so I think we can move on to um, everyone's just like a general rating on the prequel. I guess we can do it out of Mockingjay's, sure. Um, I think I gave it four out of five stars on Goodreads, so I don't remember, but I, I really enjoyed this book. Um, it was a really easy read, which I love YA because it's just you can just read it <laughs> and not have to think super hard. So yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. I gave it four Mockingjay's out of five. Okay, I'll go. Um, <laughs> so I really did not like this book very much. Um, and it's tricky, I guess, because of course, like I say, like when I read the Hunger Games novels, I was much younger and maybe the way that I read books is a little bit different now, but I just reread those. And of course, nostalgia is playing a part, but I still love those. And I still really think they're really good stories. And for me, like the original Hunger Games, I think is actually a very well constructed story where, at least for like the three, the first like three fourths of it, like you, it's really is a page turner in a way where like new tensions and new stakes and new information are getting revealed in a really fun way. Chap within each chapter, like every single chapter in that book, I think advances something interesting. And I, I really didn't feel that with this. I felt like this was really poorly paced, and I just didn't understand most of the characters and the way that they were acting and the things they wanted. And it just was, that was very much a sticking point for how much I was enjoying it. But, you know, it wasn't like awful and there was, there was good stuff in there and it was interesting to see the world from this point of view and to see it um, at this point in time. I thought that was a cool idea, but I just didn't, I just didn't get into it very much. So yeah, I'll give it like a, I think like a two and a half or a three um, mocking Jays or what have you. Yeah, I'm going to unfortunately agree with uh, Zach. I think I gave this a, a one on Goodreads. Um, I think this is like a, is a lore book um, to add to the understanding of the world. It's a lot of fun. But I felt, in some ways, I felt like this was a mistake of point of view. Um, Snow is a character. It's, I don't, I don't know, we'll talk about him later. It's, I, I don't know, it, my my general feeling with this is that I really struggled to get to this book in a way that I never did with any of the Hunger Games books. Um, it felt really unfocused, and I kept like waiting for. I, like I was shocked halfway through when I was like, "Oh my god, we're going to see the entirety of the Hunger Games." That's what this book is about. I <laughs> I thought there was going to be some other plot. Um, yeah, I, I did, like it. It did to me me no harm to read it, but I, again, like I just felt like it was a mistake of point of view and pacing. Well, for me, I was I was a bit disappointed by it. Um, so initially, when I started reading it, it was really uh, I thought the first part of it was the best part. Um, but then, as it kept going on, um, I became less interested in it. And during like the one thing that surprised me is when like before the games have even started, like all these tributes die. And then I was thinking, okay, the capital must do something about that. I was thinking that they would bring in, I don't know, do another reaping or maybe bring in, there would be some twist <laughs> involved in that. <laughs> Sorry, your kids died too soon. We got to bring in some more. <laughs> we need re replacements. <laughs> no, I thought they were going to do that too. I was a little surprised never, they did it. <laughs> never happened. Um, but then, you know, as I went through, uh, the second part of it, I was so confused with all the names and all the names of the tributes and all the <laughs> names of the mentors, and I couldn't keep track of that. And then the the third part mm. to it, that was that was interesting to learn, like um, Snow going away to become a peacekeeper in his time in District Twelve, and the but it, it still felt like a bit of a drag to me. So I, I guess overall. I mean, it wasn't horrible because there's tons of books that I've started and got through maybe 50 pages and just given up on it and never gone back. So I did finish the book. Um, so, and I, I'm sure it, it's a bit like Mockingjay, how I felt when I read Mockingjay. I was a bit disappointed by that too. So this, 
Um, initial read of Mock and G, I was disappointed. This one, I was disappointed, but I can feel like I would read it again um, and read the, the series as a whole again. Um, so I guess overall, I would read it as uh, 2.5 Mock and Jays. Hmm. I, I guess maybe my expectations were, were lower or something, especially because I didn't know this was coming. I mean, I'll, I give it like a 3.5 out of 5. I mean, it was all right. There's definitely some weird stuff, um, like who is anyone in this book with the names. But, I mean, you know, now I'm just mad that uh, they overthrew President Snow because he clearly just wanted to make Panem great again, and uh, there's nothing wrong with him. <laughs> um, I, I do think that's the problem with this is like that I, I'm like oh, okay so this is Snow and he's like this this evil guy and we want to show that he was kind of normal and like you know they kind of mix in little bits where you're like oh that's really terrible like stuff he does but in the end it's like oh this girl just like betrayed him or what exactly happened there like I was expecting more um, like more heinous stuff from him than what he did which was you know I don't know well, we'll get to that. But overall, yeah, the, you know, some pacing issues. Um, I, I did, like, on the issue of, like, the tributes being killed off, I did kind of like that because I kind of liked that it was showing that, like, they've done these Hunger Games for, uh, I don't know, what, 10 years now when we get to this book. And, you know, the whole point, like, that we see in the, the original novels is that, like, it's this big spectacle. They, they waste a ton of resources on it. They force everyone to watch like it, you know, and it just is demoralizing. And here you're like, well, no one in the districts pays attention. People in the capital hardly pay attention. We don't even care if the tributes die. So it sort of shows like how like they've, you know, they've they've tried to use this um, punishment tool, I guess, to keep people in line, and it's not really doing anything yet. And then you know, the kind of the progression of that I thought was interesting. Right to them, it's like these kids disappear and they just don't come back. Yeah, once they're reaped, they just stop paying attention. Right, because nobody so, has TVs. Right, at least not right. District Twelve. Yeah, except well, then, except in the future, they all have you know state-run TV that forces them to watch. Right. Mm. Yeah, and then like even um, along those lines, uh, Snow even mentions at one point like he expects he realizes how small of a celebrity he is. Like he thought he would be a big celebrity because he was on the Hunger Games. So. I thought I was going to be on the other side. I thought people were going to like it more because I was. I'm probably around like three and a half mocking jays. Um, I enjoyed reading it. I kind of thought it was a as a microcosm. It was sort of inverted from the main series in that it was better when it got away from the Hunger Games. Like I thought the third part of this book was the absolute best um, for the for the most part. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed the story in District 12, and it was a little easier to follow, um, more clear cut, it seemed like, and you had easier, kind of easier character names. I, I struggled through the capital part. I, I kind of joked it, it's like when Danny and you know, Song of Ice and Fire is in Marine, and you're like, you just can't keep all of the, the name, all these names that, yeah, just kind of weird, straight, like, you're like, constant. You know, um, I can't even remember the name of the Constantina. I don't know the girl that is bitten by all the snakes, like Clemencia. I, I Clemencia. Think. At least that's what I wrote in my notes. So if I call her the wrong name, so, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I mean it's just like all of these, all of these like Latin-based names, and there's just so like so many of them, and they're not very distinct characters for the most part. Um, so I don't know. I thought that kind of made made it hard. Um, overall, I did enjoy that it added some flavor to the world. I kind of thought one, and, and maybe this is, I don't read a lot of young adult fiction, so maybe this is more to the genre. But it feels like every time we get more flavor to the world, it makes it a little smaller. Like we had to me, we had too many um, families that are in the main trilogy that came up with too many like we we don't need the cute reference to Katniss plants and to like yeah it's, it's just, a lot of callbacks yeah it's like it just got to be too much the one that, that killed front, me but, on that front was 
the inexplicable hatred by Snow of mocking Jays just because oh it gives God, us this yeah. association. Oh yeah. my God. It's so annoying. <laughs> right? It just, it just like wouldn't yeah. stop. Oh it just didn't make any sense. Yeah. They repeat Some, stuff. It's yeah. inconvenient. Yeah. 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 Some of it I can forgive because like I was reading like people think that I forget what the younger girl, the younger Covey girl is, but they think that that's like Katniss's grandma or whatever. So like, I can Maud forgive. Ivory. Yeah, I can oh, forgive yeah. some of it. So like, whatever, because it's like, whatever. But yeah, the mocking jays. I was like, shut up. <laughs> I think where this book kind of struggles is that we already know Snow's end, and we, and I don't think there's a lot of character development for him throughout this book. He just kind of is a yeah. self-centered asshole at the beginning, and he's a self-centered asshole at the end. And every time you think he's gonna change his character, he just admits that that's not his thoughts yeah so it's kind of weird it's hard because it's not that this couldn't have worked because there i mean there's plenty of i mean he's he's like even in the beginning he clearly has some sociopathic tendencies and there's plenty of books out there that are about you know sociopaths that are compelling and entertaining i think it's just it's hard to feel invested when the stakes for him seem very distant and undefined. It seems like the only thing that he's really passionate about is reclaiming the family name and getting into college. And that sort of falls away very quickly. And then keeping the apartment. Yeah. Keeping the apartment, which doesn't like you, you forget about that. It doesn't, there's no sense of urgency to anything that he really cares about. Whereas everyone around him seems to have much higher stakes in, in what's going on. Um, yeah, and because of that, it's just, it's very hard to feel invested in his point of view because it's like, what is it? he? No, there's nothing that he cares about that feels like imminently, like about to be taken away, including the apartment. Like at no point does it feel like they're about to be put out on the street, even though we're told they are. Right, yeah. that's that's I mean, the key point, right? I think we are told this information, right? Like they're in danger of losing all their things, but you don't really feel it. Like there's a little bit at the beginning, like where it's showing like how desperate their living situation is where they don't have any food really, but it just never feels like it really escalates. It just feels like it's there in the background and it's not something that is a constant pressure in the right way. So you can kind of see the, I don't know. It's like sometimes um, Suzanne Collins like gives you very obvious puzzle pieces to put together. And it's like from the moment that they start talking about, how much the Plinth family loves Coriolanus Snow. Like, hmm, this really Coriolanus' family is having money problems and he has these really rich people that really, really love him and think he's great. Wonder how this is gonna work out. Like <laughs> Yeah, I'm because like, I'm of nothing he's really too. done. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, I was like a little skeptical when I found out it was like kind of from it was gonna be from President Snow's perspective, but like I think she did like as good of a job as she could have with the character she chose like she didn't make him like empathetic which I liked but she made him understandable and she was like casually able to sprinkle in like a lot of prejudice and disdain and just like not nice things about him and like his thoughts so it was like you kind of were able to like get the story but not it wasn't like she was trying to justify him in a way that would make us be like oh but he was actually okay person like he just (laughs) cared about his family and whatever like we see like there's this like hatred towards the districts like a really they they really don't see them as like human basically and like even he doesn't because he's like oh lucy gray is not really district she's like kobe and she just (laughs) happened to be stuck you know like the hoops that he jumps through right yeah. But um but I mean at, at a certain point though it felt like you know when he gets he, he gets sent to the peacekeepers and he gets sent off it's like oh well you know what he's he's going to change his life around and, but you know that's not where the story's going so you're like well what's going to fuck this up you know Yeah it's I mean like, he well, like I'll bonded just betray with my friend real quick Yeah he like bonded with all the district peacekeepers he was like oh wait they're not from the capital like uh, I guess they're different though because they're peacekeepers now it doesn't make them district anymore like They wear the uniform yeah that's Yeah different. It's. Um, it feels like. Sorry, just in a story where we already know the conclusion, the arc would be that he's tempted with something else, like genuinely tempted, and then rejects it on some level. And that does happen at the end, where he's given like a vague opportunity to to escape and go. I guess like shit in the woods for the rest of his life. Um, but we see like that. that <laughs> like that was. In woods. Yeah, like it was never actually like a temptation for him. Like there was never. 
inner conflict because as soon as he's given an opportunity to like change his mind, he's like, Oh, I better kill her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause um, he, he didn't want to do that. He felt like maybe he was about to be forced cause they're going to find out. And maybe I should yeah, run. It was, it was purely it was out of like, necessity. Yeah. Right. It's self-preservation. It was never like, I could live in a cabin yeah. in the woods. It'd be a great life. Yeah. He was um, trying to I convince also, himself of that until he didn't have to. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also just was like, this is not a super big thing, but I was just like curious what you guys thought about how it wasn't in first person and like how the rest of the series is all told from first person and like why it was not in first person. Like, I don't know. It was just something that I was surprised I when I started reading. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I care a lot more about point of view than what, than the pronouns. Yeah. So that's kind of my take on that. I just wanted to move on to like the rest of the main cast then. Um, the first person, okay, I don't know if I say his name correctly, Sejanus, 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 okay, Sejanus, um, I didn't really like that he was from District 2, because, like, the whole main series portrays District 2 as, like, really loyal to the capital, and, like, I'm pretty sure that they didn't actually join in in the Dark Days Rebellion or whatever, so, like, why is he the representative of like the districts have rights and like fuck the capital and all this kind of you know shit. that's a good point because they have all the peacekeepers in district two right like that's the main training area military area yeah i think he I'll might say, just I... go, ahead. go ahead zach i was gonna say i think the circumstances might be a little bit different um at this point in the timeline where they're not quite at... and, I th- and i think you could actually make the argument that the, this like betrayal that the plinths have where they go over to the capital side is one of the reasons why district two ended up being so favored in the future. But yeah, I think at this point, like all the districts are very, were, were for the most part opposed to the capital. So it's not as though like he wouldn't have any motivation or reason for being anti-capital. See, this is where a good fantasy map would, would be helpful in <laughs> me, like buying into the world. <laughs> district I think two, the pr- where is that? I think it's I right think- next to the capital. I think the problem with him is he grew up with these people and he just doesn't feel comfortable in the capital. And then one of his classmates comes to die, basically. And of course, he's going to like have thoughts about this that are anti-capital. I think the rest of them just don't understand what he's going through. He, I think he might, he was easily, I think, my favorite character out of this book um <laughs> tough choice it, huh <laughs> yeah i mean like yeah <laughs> yeah it's not you know it, I, bit, uh... it's not because he's nice um i just genuinely felt bad for him and i also think his motivations were more clear than a lot of other characters uh and his dilemma was more clear cut and also just like there was not much in this book that i felt particularly moved by um but i genuinely found it very like his death is for me very chilling like it's a very like powerful mm. image of like the mocking jays repeating his last word which is just him calling out for his mother um like i generally almost felt sickened by that maybe that's just like part of the climate that we're currently living in of just like this teenager killed and yeah he's called. still a boy yeah just a child and uh like but yeah that was the one part of the book where i was like oh god like this is actually like really like riveting writing in a way that i I found very little (laughs) like the rest of the book to be riveting and also like it's it it's the only thing that Coriolanus seems to have like a really powerful reaction to in the entire book is like he seems to be like physically sickened and guilt ridden about what he's just done (laughs) he did directly cause it (laughs) yeah he did cause it but he he also he, he regretted doing it almost immediately in a way, and he was like, well, they'll never find it. It'll be fine. Everything will be fine. And it's like, dude, you already did it. It's the one part of the book where it genuinely feels like he's conflicted about what he's... Like, he has a moral dilemma, and he regrets what he's done. And so for me, like, that might like that, that whole little scene of him betraying his friend and maybe realizing that this guy was actually his friend, even though he never thought of him as his friend, um, it was easily the best part of the book for me. And for that reason, I think I, I like... I connected with Sejanus, even though he's a bit of a dope, and I felt really bad for him. I mean, isn't isn't Sejanus basically all of Snow's character arc? I mean, like he doesn't really change with with uh, Lucy Gray. He just kind of is like, yeah, I think I love her, or whatever. Or doesn't really know her that well. I think but there was a Sejanus, moment, like they actually become friends. Um, despite I think him there was a like, moment when he gave guy. her the compact that he actually did care for her. I, I I don't think he didn't care for her, but I don't think that she was more important to him than himself. Mm-hmm. I think I, right, some, right. something I'll say about it relative to both these characters, and we can talk more about Lucy Gray in a bit, but 
Something that I think is interesting about the POV that that you know I think could have been developed more, but I thought was cool is that the fact that we see the world through Snow's eyes, it really changes the way we perceive these characters because he is so narcissistic and like self-centered that he like always filters his understanding of these other people by how it benefits him or how it, you know, it it helps his ego in some respect. So like in some ways that makes the other characters feel worse, but understanding that that's because of the way that he views the world, this very selfish perspective. Like, I think that's just an interesting way to, to look at the book. It's weird that the fact that the only reason why Sejanus thought they were friends is because Snow decided to like, just ignore him rather than treat him like shit. And because he just ignored him, he was like, Oh, you're my best friend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because well, it was yeah, below I mean, the we, snows. We, yeah. We, we were all kind of rooting for Sejanus, right? Like, because yeah. I at one point I found yeah. myself, and I know this is silly, like, but you know, this would have been like an actual way they could have surprised us, is if like at some point, like he like Snow dies or something, and he takes Snow's name, and we're like he's the he actually ends up becoming President Snow or something. I know well, that would have been a more interesting story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, like, that would have been a good twist. Yeah, I actually, but I was like, that'd be crazy. Yeah, no. While I was reading, I was like, "Wait, like, does he is he one of the people that like Snow kills when in Mockingjay? Like, Finnick starts talking about like how Snow rose to power." So I literally opened Mockingjay and like scanned it for that section to like reread, and I was like, "Nope, never mind. Okay, he probably dies earlier." Well, like the plinth, like isn't that that's a name we've heard in the in the um, the original books, right? Like it felt so familiar. Yeah, I thought it felt familiar too, but I don't. I didn't really look into it beyond just rereading that section of Mockingjay. So I might've just been like making it up, you know, being like, hmm, there's so many other, like, cause we have like Tigris who's in Mockingjay, which I will talk about her later. And like a lot of other things. So I was like, maybe I was just trying to make more connections that were I there. was going to ask that. So that's the same character? Yeah. His yeah. cousin? Yeah. yeah. I thought it was oh. odd. Like, yeah. like, what the fuck happened there? <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So do you want to move on to Lucy Gray? Cause we touched on her a little bit. Um, sure. So I really. I, I was very guys, enthusiastic. Yeah, I mean, you guys all <laughs> have seen my things about how I just hate romance so much, especially in YA. And I was like so happy there was at least not a love triangle until the part three, when it was like barely a love triangle, so whatever. But I just. There was like, no love triangle. There wasn't was even like, really any romance. Yeah, <laughs> but like it was like, like you yeah. know whatever. So that's I think that's probably what led to me liking this book a lot more because there's just like barely any romance. But Lucy Gray, oh my gosh, the moment she was introduced, I was like, I'm gonna hate this character because she's like, I like to sing and I'm different and like da 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 da, and like and I I'm a free spirit. Yeah, she's like I'm a free spirit and da da da, da and like I'm just like classic every like YA girl character who you know <laughs> basically it's just look, Abby doesn't like girl. hippies <laughs> girl well, was playing like... the Hunger Games before it was a game okay <laughs> yeah. she wrote she wrote the playbook but it's just like I don't know she's like the proto manic, manic pix, pixie dream girl where like she's just like so different from everybody else and like yeah it's she's... it's a little odd it felt like the maybe if all that we had seen is that she shoves a snake down that girl's shirt, that would have been pretty great. But the fact that she goes on to like lead, like snatch the mic away and like lead the crowd in a song, I was like, okay, like <laughs> I, I I really got tired of hearing the word covey. I listened to the audio book. Yes, yes. And I was like, is anyone going to tell me what the fuck a covey is? What, like, is this just like a, a traveling band and that's their name? Or is this like a like an Appalachian term I'm not familiar when, with? When the mayor of District 12 banned music, I was like, good. <laughs> <laughs> good work, man. I, yeah, I think the covey are supposed to be like Romani in the North Americas. But I don't know, maybe it is like an Appalachian thing. I didn't really look into it. I just thought it was a made up word, but. Yeah. Maybe. Did anyone? What does like... everyone think about the um, you know the 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 point when um Lucy Gray mentioned about um sort of like the games being rigged and the victors being uh, sorry the people that were chosen in the reapings being rigged and the the fact that it was all staged for her name to be called because she was involved with. Uh, Billy and he was involved with the mayor's daughter. Right, she thinks it was rigged. The drawing right. was rigged. Which, which I, I think, think is very the possible. That the Hunger Games are so are so um, unregulated, like compared to what we see later on. 
Like, it's just like, we just got to have two kids from each district and they're all going to die and it's fine. And it's like, yeah, the mayor could just call someone's name. It's cool. You know, no yeah. one's going to double check that. Did anyone think uh, she was playing him the whole time? Like, at entirely. the end. Enti- really? Yeah, I, I wasn't quite sure because I'm like, in. At the end, like, it, it's again, I, like, there was some confusion about, like, okay, was. Did she really just, like, figure things out or was, like. Did she run away when he shot at her? <laughs> yeah, like. <laughs> I kept feeling that, but I think that is not what was happening but i think for me i just didn't understand like why she would be so willing to be interested in him to the point that like she like genuinely loves this person who is like part of the system that's trying to kill her and isn't like yeah like a beyond, great guy like I mean, hunger games or where she needs him she kept like, saying that you I, didn't I thought... choose to be here either like yeah she thinks he's a prisoner in this as well she doesn't realize that he actually thinks the hunger games is a good idea she just came it across to me as more, more naive than she was presented. Does that make sense? Like, she was oh. presented as the savvy person who, like, is maneuvering in some sense, but she just seemed naive in this relationship to me. I don't know. I think she began it not caring about him, but caring about what he stood for, like, her mentor or whatever. He stood for like, sandwiches. Uh, well, yeah. no, I think he actually, <laughs> she actually wanted him to like her for some reason. But I don't yeah. think that she cared about him at that time. But I think she might have, like began to like him just because he was kind of nice to her. It would be a more interesting story if they actually had the conversations that we feel like they should have, which is that, hey, like, you're actually participating in my murder. Oh, I have conflicting feelings about that. Um, Yeah, I just, I didn't understand why she would like him other than the fact that he was feeding her. Uh, It didn't, it just didn't feel like, like, there there should have, if they were going to, like, eventually fall in love, it felt like there needed to be some sort of, like, rub at the beginning where they just there was no like connection or there was like a genuine dislike and then it like through strife yeah. and adversity like they like became a team but that didn't happen it was just like she was okay with them at the beginning because she's this beacon of neutrality where she's like i'm not district i'm not anybody like okay mm-hmm. That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, they she, did save so, each other's so lives with though. her with her like kissing him and stuff for the hunger games and i'm like oh she's just like totally like please do everything you can to save my life and then the fact that when he shows up, she's like, oh, yeah, we'll just, we're together now. But she's also kind of, like, very aloof about the whole situation. To me, it was like, I didn't like the fact that it ends with, you know, he learns his lesson because this terrible district girl tries to kill him. You know, like, it, it was just weird. To me, it would have made a lot more sense if she was like, hey, can you take me back to the Capitol? And now she's like a boss bitch. And you know what I mean? Like... I'd be like, oh, okay, so she was, like, kind of playing him all along, and, like, they're yeah. kind of, like, rising in power together. That I get. Or she kills him and takes his identity, and she's the real <laughs> Snow. She's Snow. <laughs> it's a fake beard all along. Yeah, I was fully expecting him to find out that she was living it up in the Capitol while he was stuck out in the sticks. Um, yeah. But alas, it, maybe I would have felt more if, like, it seemed like his love was at least like if somebody's love seemed genuine <laughs> right yeah. other than just like the mother's Mon love Ivory. for Sejanus <laughs> yeah it didn't yeah it definitely didn't feel like their relationship was the thing tethering him from becoming like a murderous sociopath like like that that sort of bothered me at the end because i don't know i got i liked most of the story how he related to his class, classmates that you know he definitely just didn't think emotionally very much like there definitely were sociopathic tendencies and inability to connect with other people that i thought felt very genuine Um, a teenage boy that had no interest in girls yeah there's something wrong with him yeah and i I, I don't okay he could be gay but (laughs) you know what i mean like nice safe he He didn't say that he was gay He yeah. wasn't interested in the boys either. I'm just saying a teenage boy that isn't sexually active in any way is kind of weird. Listen, um, when you're starving, your libido goes way down. <laughs> yeah. and But, like, I think that was accurate. But then I didn't feel like Lucy Gray was the thing that tethered him to his humanity. Like, I, did, I guess enough stakes and weight weren't put into that relationship. And, like, there was a lot of it, but it didn't feel like if, if she leaves him suddenly, like in the epilogue, he's he's as evil as he is at the end of you know in the main trilogy. Like he's that, like he's that level of 
depraved where he doesn't care about killing people and doesn't yeah. about anyone you know like i, I don't she, know she, she should have been the one thing that he genuinely cared about so that he's gutted by her leaving him or betraying him because he does have these flickers of like wondering at his lack of feeling like he's not a complete sociopath there's there's moments where like he's he contemplates the fact that you know his classmates are are dead and that he that he's kind of shocked by that and maybe not misses them but also just like thinks about like the fact that they've been together for so long like he has like some inner conflict about how he feels about other people um which you know if he had an actual emotional arc it, like it would mean that he actually learned how to care about something and then it was taken <laughs> from him um. see i saw i saw like when she betrayed him like that was like when he like uh, like because he was having these thoughts that like oh like the district people might maybe just be like normal people like us and then like when she officially like finally betrayed him he was like she's Why did she like, betray him the- well, like not it was only in him, his head. That's a matter yeah, no, of point of view, well, right? So well, she knows okay, that yes, he's she didn't, sorry. Yeah, so she didn't betray. I don't think that she betrayed him. Like I think that she thought that he was going to kill her. But like, anyways, when yeah. she like when that whole thing happened, like that was like his justification for being like, I don't need to like think about the districts. Like I don't need to have this like moral conflict about like are the districts, you know, equal to capital people? Like do we treat them fairly or whatever? It was like no, they're conniving like terrible people that just like want us all dead and you get it. She tried to put a snake on me and you know all this kind of stuff so I think like her final thing was like that was kind of what pushed him over the edge to be like like, not because he cared about her but it was kind of like the final justification for his um feelings regarding the capital versus the district but but honestly I think he ends up thinking they're equal just that they're all terrible and they need a strong hand to rule them and this is the system that they have he does believe throughout the book that it's if it wasn't for the capital, everything would be chaos. I mean, he never wavers from that. The right. part where he says that explicitly to Lucy Gray, and she just kind of is okay with it. I just didn't understand. <laughs> that was like one part where, like, yeah. he basically says, "Yeah, like the capital is a necessary part of the system." And she was like, "Okay, that's fine." But it seems like <laughs> she was kind of holding her cards back at that. Maybe point. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Wasn't that was that before or after he said he killed three people that summer? Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> the one yeah, of, like. I, I, a Freudian uh, slip. I meant myself. Back. You fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a dummy. Um, he... Yeah, it, it felt like I could sympathize a little with her in that situation. It seems like she's trying not to provoke an argument. Um, yeah, yeah, when, yeah. But like from a reader standpoint, it's like there probably should be an argument at this point. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It just stacked up on top of all the other like acceptances of the way he is and where he's coming from. I just like it just compounded for me yeah um also real quick i posted this in the chat but just want to clarify i looked it up and a covey is like a flock of birds or a pair of birds that have young birds it's related to birds basically suzanne collins loves birds that's of the, course the end of the that's fine. i'm fine with that fine. <laughs> or apparently it can just be a small group of people which i think i remember my appalachian great-grandmother saying but I don't know. I might be projecting. No, they're Your not mama. from Appalachia. They're from all over, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, they're not district. What are you they're talking not about? District. What's wrong with you? We take yeah. their sides. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying it's an old word, and no one yeah. loves old words in the real world more than Appalachians. Mama, yeah. Um, all right, so should we move on Granny to... Granny fan, Katie. Granny <laughs> fan. Um... Okay, I just wanted to briefly talk about Dr. Gall and Dean Highbottom because um, regarding Dean Highbottom, I was super confused about him. I was like, so does he hate the Hunger Games? Like, what is he like? He like, hates I just, them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he hates the fact that it was related to him because okay. of his, his idea. Yeah. His father yeah. like wrote it down when he was drunk one night. So obviously he's capital, but for me, he came across as like a really badly drawn version of like Haymitch, like a budget yeah. Haymitch basically where he is like this person who is scarred by the concept of the games and he's just an addict and like that's the extent of him really it just didn't feel yeah. very sketched out but it's fine yeah. he's a minor character and then dr gall was this mad scientist who like was just batshit insane and social contract just like i don't know she was just a I crazy did, like... person like she w- I was not terribly impressed as her like as an antagonist. I the one thing they do that I did like about her character is that it's pointed out that the reason that she she sees 
people as animals who will turn on each other in a heartbeat is because that's how her brain functions and she's just not capable of imagining that other people might have like empathetic and moral drive. She's just like, well, I see people as things, so everybody must see people as yeah. things. Right? She constructs <laughs> situations so that that prove her point essentially. Like she tries to create scenarios that support her worldview, which is a cool kind of sadistic motivation. Well, and I guess the thing I liked about her is I can actually see how Snow, like, being with her for 20 years could be the guy that he is in the main trilogy. I mean, if you hear hippity hoppity that many times, I would also become an idiot. <laughs> oh, my like gosh. I murdered. Like, yeah, I just, I, I don't think there was enough in these books to justify him being the full sociopath he was in that blog. And maybe he's not. Maybe he's just trying to convince himself that he is. But, um, he, but I could see that you know spending a bunch of time with her after that. Yeah, and I think also he he's lived a long life of being part of this this system, and like you can see how that would slowly corrupt him over time. Like, I, like it's just a it's hard to base everything on how he was when he was eighteen or whatever. Like he's yeah. going to change a lot over that. Plus, of course. Whenever we see anything from his point of view, it's just going to look less evil to us. So I think there's plenty yeah. of fucked up shit he did in this book. Yeah, I, I, I never thought he was a good character from the beginning. Just, I don't know. Yeah, his 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 one his flickers of kindness are always tempered by self interest, right? Like, right every time. He, he will save Sejane, and, and that can work. Like, the, like we love plenty of characters in, you know, A Song of Ice and Fire who are self-interested, but still, you know. Like Braun. Like, like Jamie, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, can wor- it can work, um, but they have to actually, like, you have to be convinced that there's at least, like, some genuine interest. Like, we like Jamie because he's self-interested, but we also, like, gradually feel that, yeah, he's actually in denial about what he actually, how he actually feels about other people. And here, it never feels like Snow is in denial. It generally feels like he just hates everyone. <laughs> like, he, <laughs> he resents Sir, like Sejanus. Like, he'll go out and save him, but the whole time, he's like, I'm only doing this, like, to curry favor with his family, and because I don't want to get in trouble, I actually really hate this guy for, like, putting me in this position. <laughs> well, in, in fairness, I feel like I would hate Sejanus, too, if I were somehow linked to him, <laughs> because he's... Like, I understand he's very pure-hearted and everything, but, like, he's not smart enough to be a rebel. Like, no, he's a dope. Like, and that's yeah. the pro. Like, the last thing you need in your life is to be connected to someone who's trying to overturn everything, but is really dumb about it, and the consequences are going to come back. Yeah, on. and eventually he he accepts that fact. So, <laughs> that's I mean, that. like, yeah. yeah. And, and One of his blind, few moments but... of humanity is when when Sejanus shows up and Snow is actually happy to see him. Yeah. That's one of the few moments where I was like, oh, maybe maybe this is like a... Something's going to happen with him to make him turn... Like, maybe Sejanus is going to get killed by someone and that's going to, like, reinforce his feeling on the districts. But no, that's not what happened. The, the capital killed him and it still didn't reinforce anything for him. Yeah. I mean, essentially, he killed him, right? Yes. Or, like, killed him, yeah. yeah. But that let's face actually, it, he's the capital. I did actually like that moment when he, it's like he just can't help himself. Like, like he's slowly bonded with this guy, but at the same time, like there's this driven impulse where he's like, "Well, I can't not record him <laughs> while he's confessing right? this information." <laughs> but then he, uh, like, he also regrets it like immediately after. And I actually like that. Like I said, like any any point in this book where there was any sort of like emotional conflict um or tension i was very grateful for and i did like that like that felt like a genuinely like like a genuine demonstration of like inner conflict of his character of like he actually is starting to like him but at the same time like he just cannot help himself it's like i i need to like angle things in my favor i wonder if he hadn't lied to him would it have changed the way he felt? Because, like, when he finds out that sejanus isn't being honest with him that's when he starts to like turn on sejanus a little bit and I yeah, wonder if that's... Go ahead. Well, because his whole thing is control. And so when Sejanus is, like, kind of being this unknown when he's lying to him, I think that Snow is like, well, I have to be in control. Like, I'm in this environment where, like, if I don't know what's going on, then, like, I'm, you know, I'm vulnerable. And so because Sejanus was lying to him, 
But also, I think at the same time, like, Snow would do whatever he could to get back to the Capitol, to be honest. Like, even if he didn't knowingly do it, he finds, like, justification for his actions really fast because he's just wants to, he doesn't want to be wrong or, like, morally, he doesn't want to view himself as morally skewed, I guess. This book made me think about, like, how many sociopaths are in my world where I think, like, someone is my genuine friend, but really deep down, they're ready to turn me over to the FBI at a drop of <laughs> It could be uh, any one of you. Well, hopefully you're not here. doing anything that would require that. <laughs> I don't think the stakes are as high <laughs> regarding if any of your friends are actually you, sociopaths. Because if you are, Abby will turn you in. Yeah. <laughs> it just has to be so pathetic from like if this book was told from Sejanus's point of view how pathetic would it be he's like oh this guy loves me he's my friend oh, <laughs> no that would be worse for sure that's so sad oh my god it'd be like the death of a puppy the book <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness um okay and then I just wanted to real quick talk about Tigris I don't know if you guys had any other characters to talk about but like my roommate who's reading this book now um because I gave it to her she was just asked me she's like is there any purpose to Tigris beyond like lifting snow up like being this like woman that is just always in snow's corner like her really have any purpose beyond that and being a callback to Mockingjay she's like- which doesn't make sense because I didn't imagine her being an 85 year old woman in Mockingjay, but whatever. <laughs> right. I guess it's, I, I just looked that up earlier because it does say that Katniss describes her skin as being like, you know, wrinkled and old. So it makes sense. But I did not imagine that she was like Snow's cousin. Um, yeah. And she, she's just sort of like his hype man, I guess, in this. And to show that like his family's not like terrible, they're just people. Well, yeah. I mean, he's the only path out of their current predicament. I mean, because she can't at this point go to the university or whatever, like, so she's not going to help them out, be able to help them back to their prominence. So I think that's a lot of it. I think the role in the story is obviously to like soften our view of him somewhat and give him a human connection. Um, I don't think it works particularly well. (laughs) But you didn't think his racist grandma was enough? No, <laughs> the grandma. Um, I like her. the grandma. Yeah, that is a fantastic term. She's very true to her character. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just this old man. I kept, um, I kept thinking yeah. that maybe there would be a point where there would be a mention that Tigress that we hear in the story has a daughter and she calls her Tigress or, or something like that, but then. I was thinking most likely it is that that same character, but the back of my mind, I was thinking maybe it's it's not, and it will be like someone related to her. But it kind of makes Tigris from the like from the main story cooler to me. Like to know that that she's related to Snow and she's turned on him because she's seen what he is, like that she's helping rebels and all that. Like I thought, like because like. Oh, in my brain, like, when I read The Mockingjay, I thought, because like, I haven't read, um, I haven't finished rereading Mockingjay in a couple of years, like, I'm not finished with it, but when we meet her, I thought it was, like, she just hated the capital because they, like, kicked her out, they didn't accept her because she, like, turned herself basically into a cat person and stuff, so it was yeah. just, like, I, thought, I thought they made her turn into a cat person. No, no I, I think... think it, I think it was she was a stylist for the games, and she just kind of was, like, really into the cat person trend. And then they were like, okay, you went too far. Like, no, no more. <laughs> and you so could just, argue that, of course, part the... of it, because in the movie, she says that they forced that, like, Snow didn't like how she looked. So he turned her into a cat person. No, yeah, that but doesn't in, happen. In the book, book. is different. That doesn't happen. Uh, in the book, yeah. And, yeah, I talked to Glenn a little bit about this. I, I think uh, so. The motivation in the in Mockingjay appears to just be that because she was cast out as a uh, stylist for stylist the games. For the... Um, yeah, I think uh, that's the only motivation. But obviously, she's suggesting here that something more happened. We just never find out at this point what that was. So something happened to break the relationship beyond repair. But it's still a mystery. Oh, good. There might be a sequel from her perspective. Uh, just. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like sad. if this had been the first book she wrote, it would not have done well. So but, during the hung- Hunger Games, there's the character Reaper, who's like the big scary tribute, who apologizes to everyone in advance for killing them. He's like, I'm sorry, yep. I have to do this. <laughs> like, it's just a, like, a favorite. 
like a cool image of like him stomping around the arena and he like makes a cape for himself. It reminded me of uh, Akira, like Tetsuo at the end when he has his cape. Oh, yeah. And like, like brooding in the arena, like <laughs> contemplating his war crimes. Um, no, yeah. Sacking Sacking up all the bodies. Blob. Yeah, I do like there's these brief flickers of like humanity since we're seeing the Hunger Games from an outside perspective of like what these kids are thinking and like the ones that are like purely driven to survive no matter what and the others who are like trying to like preserve some degree of 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 like humanity towards each other and obviously like he has rabies and he's kind of crazy but him like lining up the bodies felt like like obviously like it felt like a good moment like a good character beat of like this like strange rabies ter- induced organizing yeah like yeah. terrified and also like compassionate and yeah i did like that detail so sure. the first the first part is uh, the mentor, which is basically we are introduced to Snow and his family and um, like his project, which is to work on Hunger Games and how he wants to um, restore pride to his family. And we meet Lucy Gray. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much the first part. Um, basically, like the key points that I have from this is um, the tributes are treated like shit. <laughs> um, Arachne is murdered after taunting another tribute or taunting a tribute um Cori- Cori- yeah. how the fuck do you say his name coriolanus Cor- coriolanus yeah yeah i thought his name was cornelius until this year when i read this book i thought it was anyways um he comes up with like all the Yukon cornelius yeah he comes up with a lot of the ideas for like the future games um we get the mutt snakes biting clemencia uh, there's a tour of the arena and bombs are somehow set off, uh, which Spurring. both tributes and mentors die. Lucy Gray saves Coriolanus and Marcus runs off. So that's like kind of basically what happens in this part. Um, so this is the first the first time they have mentors, right? Like yes, yes. Before this, they just sort of like showed up and threw them in the arena until they died, and that was the yep, end of it. That's all yep. that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Which is so, um, insane. Like when they took him to the monkey house in the zoo, I was like, "Are you fucking serious?" <laughs> like, no. it, it and they was... don't feed them at all. Yeah, that's it, what it sounds like. Yeah, they come in cattle cattle cars. Like they don't yeah. feed them. Well, I think, and I mean, think like, it was a basic point that, like, I mean, when they started dying beforehand, like they weren't getting fed, and they're like, "Man, if you guys want these people to like die as like a show, like." Shouldn't you take care of them before the... Well, I think the before, game? I think yeah. in the previous games, it was like they literally showed up and were immediately, like, thrown into the arena. So they had... <laughs> this time they had, like, three days or whatever. I don't know, I remember how long before they got thrown into the arena. And so they just kind of didn't really think about that. Because they're... Yeah, and then... Piece, piece well, and then shit. the explosion. The explosion in the arena delayed it more. And Why do you yeah. think they erased this one from history? Um, because I don't know. Um, Cause it, nobody knew that it, they, they cheated. I mean, I guess they kind of cheated. I think well, there was still... footage of, of the, like the boys going in and all that. I mean, not like that aired, but they basically were like, let's just delete it and forget about this. Isn't one it and, like weird no that e- even in the future ones, the Capitol doesn't have the games on tape delay. I mean, get your shit together. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you just do at need least to like edit a five things. second in case one of the in case one of them throws up a gang sign, right? So I just want to <laughs> engage in this for a second. So imagine there is a tape delay. What do they do? Like in the original Hunger Games, where the, the various switch to happens. another switch to another person. I don't know, like switch to no, a different camera. I specifically mean the the berries thing. How do they prevent that if they have a tape delay? Oh, at that point, yeah. There's there's. I guess they could. Uh, cut to like uh caesar being like what will happen this is crazy you know and people are like what well it can <laughs> be no else watch. it doesn't have to be live like it could be a day behind and nobody would know except for the capital yeah i just like how do they prevent that That's do they true. just shoot one of them i guess i think like i mean yeah they probably would just like because in the in the future games they have like basically the whole arena is augmented so they could just like kill one of them be like oh he died of a snake bite or something and like oh now they you know we're done <laughs> but um yeah i just yeah. feel like a, a capital that is that focused on control that they wouldn't have some sort of like hip pocket thing waiting just in case something crazy happened like what happened in the the future right. Hunger games yeah and, I, and like i what... think it's because the voyeuristic nature of it like they don't want to you know distill it down to an hour-long you know reality tv show after they edit everything out 
they want everyone to be watching live as it happens, follow people, like understand that like these people are in there in real time for days suffering. And like, maybe they think that's the most effective. Yeah, imagine if they found out it was a tape delay, it would kill the ratings. <laughs> <laughs> that and the whole it... betting part would kind of, <laughs> you well, can't send them also... food yeah. in real time. Yeah. And then also I think it's like, um, after the end of it, it's like kind of implied that the capital people seem to apparently have really short memories because like how like i don't even know like the people people who are living in this time are still alive in the end and it's like at the end of the hunger games they always like show them like the final cut of the games where it's just like from the victor's perspective or like whatever and so it's just like okay that's what happened and like we accept that even though we all saw <laughs> the actual hunger games and like we'll just accept this narrative and like whatever and they don't give a shit so i think and it's these, just like these they're people just all forget very all the people in the capital are still pretty darn hungry, so they have other things to. Yeah, wake up. You don't up, think they would have been talking about it? Remember yeah. Lucy Gray? I mean, they say only one person from twelve ever won, but remember that Lucy Gray that like shocked the world? Like nobody yeah. ever talks about that. Wake so up, people! Annoying snake girl. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, actually, but... um, in I remember in the first book they didn't actually say that Hamish was the only person that won. They say he was the only one like, alive. The only one alive, exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought um, he was the only one from 12 that ever won, but I guess I, I was wrong. I could, yeah, I that's what I thought, too. I, I think it's, like, it interpretative. Was... I thought like, that's I, why they had to wipe the Hunger Games from history. But, I mean, they've been doing it for 75 years, so if, like, someone won early on, they could easily be dead. You know, yeah. So. Like, Mags was, like, 80-something in the Catching Fire, so, like... Oh, why'd you have to bring Mags up? <laughs> Sorry. I guess that's why I thought they had to re-erase it from history because there was never a winner of 12 and that's why she had to like go back and be oh yeah but that yeah, was erased from history a, so I thought it was, it was okay. like for, for continuity but uh, maybe well, I mean, and I, I think, was thinking to myself why not just have them be from any other fucking district <laughs> I mean I think these games made the capital look bad more than anything when you have like a, a tribute that was lining up the bodies and cutting the flag of Pan Am like where that's very, you know, it may, you know, it was a very sympathetic to the actual tributes, and it seemed like this was the first time that they'd ever really dropped the the mutts into the actual battle. Yeah, and, and then yeah. they killed everyone, but then the one girl like draped yeah. herself in them. So yeah, there yeah. were there was a lot there were a lot of moments that were kind of comparable in in upstaging the capital to the berries and yeah. With Katniss and Peta, like there were there were comparable moments to that, and I think they wanted to erase that. I will say this was the slowest rebellion ever. (laughs) Sixty fucking years, and you really didn't make any traction. It makes Um, sense though that like, because it does even feel like among the mentors that there's a growing sense of like this is wrong and we shouldn't be doing this. It makes sense then that like the way that you pacify even the people in the capital is like tying in corporate interests. And treating like the the tributes a little better, and like making me like, look how like we're feeding them, like we're bringing them bedding and their... rooting and teeth. Yeah. make them yeah. care. Yeah, and then oh, like yeah, also... it's brilliant, yeah. and that's that's kind of what's cool, right? To see how it changes and to see them yeah. learn that stuff. Like the yeah. like that version of the games is so much more interesting than just dropping them into a pit. And <laughs> well, yeah, that's why the Hunger like... Games is a better book. <laughs> yeah, they like the tributes need motivation. Like they get. Like, we have to keep the districts poor, and then the people who win get food and a nice house, and yada, yada, you know, it's like they have to... Yeah, I mean, the Hunger Games portion of this is probably the least interesting portion of it. Not that there aren't significant things that happen in the uh, the games in this book, but it's like, it's in, like, an old stadium. There's, like, you know, where's, where's like, the cool moving ground and spinning tops and shit, you know? Yeah, yeah well, that's Stick the weird thing. It, it, it's obviously <laughs> supposed to be intentionally shit and boring and awful, but it's still it's still, it's still boring and awful. <laughs> They're doing way better awful. with technology. Their first drone crashed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, was, that was so funny. <laughs> that was funny. So I guess, we have, I guess we're already on the prize, which, like, moved on to part two, which is the prize, uh, which is the Hunger Games. Yeah. So we have the Hunger Games, uh, Sejanus sneaking into the arena, which was really random, like weird, um, mutt snakes, um, that kind of shit. So, yeah, I don't know. There was just a lot of fuck ups in this. Um, like, I don't know. It just, I guess, yeah, we talked, we basically talked about part two already. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah. so I will uh, say that everyone uh, thinks about the um, the plint pies and the the chance for that scholarship by being the winning mentor. Um, I was just confused because I thought that was like already the like thing that they were gonna get. No, they get a very, re- very vaguely described prize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, depending on how they do, they would get like something, but okay, like a scholarship. Yeah. Well, yes. that, and like the Hunger different... Games people, like they just get sent back on like the you know manure train and they get to live. I guess <laughs> you're like there's no like Victor's Row or <laughs> yeah. Like past Hunger Games winners have probably died in the street because they starved to death. <laughs> yeah, they stopped yeah. caring. They stopped taping and just left them there. <laughs> Don't even send him home. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, but also with the, the demerit that um, the, there's there's the first demerit, and he's um, he's told by uh, Professor Highbottom that if he gets free, then he'll be expelled. But then it doesn't really. Well, nothing comes of it. It's hard- <laughs> Yeah, he constantly brings it up in his mind, but then nothing happens until we learn at the last, you know, at the end of that chapter. Did that surprise anyone? I was, yeah, I mean, like, not, it, once reading the third part of the series, like, the third part, like, it makes, in the ending, like, it makes sense why they, why he was, like, because he was kind of, like, set up to have to do this thing. But, yeah, I, for originally I was, like, why do they give a shit that he, like, <laughs> cheated? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just it's very cheap ways like the demerit and the plinth prize both are very cheap ways to create tr- to try to generate some stakes and attention to all this. But yeah, it never really came across. Yeah, I will say that um, one thing that I think these first two books, well, like the entire book in general, kind of clarified for me is the state of the world. Like it. This is the first time we're reading this book where I was like, oh, the world is just fucked. Like there's nothing left. Like whatsoever. Yeah, there's yeah, that's no why I was food. Like... There's mm-hmm. nothing like there's just not enough resources or they're like even to feed like the elite people at the top, it seems like. Like the fact that the capital is like is war torn as it is and people are starving was actually pretty shocking to me this <laughs> this venture. The fact that like these like the elite of like elite children are pretty inured to the fact that you know like there are bombs going off and like their parents were killed in battles and stuff it, they got cannibalizing happening up in here and so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no i was um yeah it's that's like why i was really piercer. excited yeah i was really excited for this book because i really my favorite part of the, about the hunger games is like the actual world that they live in I, I wanted to like i like i'm really interested in like basically how the entire earth kind of got fucked and now everyone's like living here and so i liked all the little tiny like meta things I guess that were introduced so um but yeah it was also though really confusing with the like the wealth discrepancy in the capital because like obviously there were like people that were fine and then there's like Coriolanus's family who's not fine so like I understand that she was trying to be like oh the capital is also fucked but like they weren't (laughs) well it's like some people profited off the war and and some others didn't well, they're. I guess they're most of their profit like was coming out of District Thirteen, and that's gone now. Yeah, and that's where they lost most of their money. And their parents are dead, so there's nobody to make any money or any financial decisions yeah. really. So they're just trying to scrape by. Yeah. What about the grandma mom? She's yeah, she's doing great. Lady, <laughs> she, she's a lady. She doesn't need to work. <laughs> it it it's interesting, like. In, in, like I, again, I read The Hunger Games like ages ago, but like the world building felt clearer to me in this book, even though I enjoyed it less. Like the fact that nobody quite knows what's out. Like th- when they talk about going and living in the wilderness, um, mm-hmm. they're like, there might be people out there. Nobody seems to know. And I'm like, it makes sense that like in a world where like only the most powerful people have access to any sort of advanced technology. It's like, they don't have internet. Like they don't even have maps. It seems like of like further areas. It makes sense that it's that they don't know what's beyond like, I don't know, Toronto. <laughs> what used to be Toronto. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, they no, could so find that, an abandoned city. Like does. Toronto? What? Is there anything beyond Toronto in Canada? Um, mm, just... uh, Montreal. I mean, I'm I'm living proof. <laughs> I don't think that was a serious. That's District Seven, I, I know. right? 
I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> I, I mean, there's got to be other cities with other people in them. Yeah, I, I mean, I there just... has to be other countries, too. It's like, what, what's China doing and all this? Yeah, like... what about the rest of the world? <laughs> well, I think it's, like, the, the implication is, like, that um, some, like, global environmental disaster happened and, like, wiped out most of humanity. And, like, according to <laughs> Panem, like, the, the, the narrative that Panem is telling is, like, basically everyone that's left on the Earth, like, got to Panem and, like, were great because we were able to, like save humanity or whatever no, we have to do everything for capital but like obviously realistically there's probably like other groups out there but totally um, it's they're a, like it's we don't want to touch yeah they're like it's we don't a... want to touch north america yeah. they're a little fucked they kill little children so <laughs> <laughs> you've got a force a, field around the entire continent and everyone else is just living normal it's a total yeah. 1984 situation where the mm. government has a complete lock on any sort of global or geographical information and so the people just don't they don't have no they have no idea like there might not be a world out there for all they know right yeah it, I, I would love to, to know if there's like mad max kings roving europe or something yeah <laughs> I hope um so. so i looked up a map and there's a bunch of different conflicting ones but i think my favorite there's one where uh, cuba is called snow island <laughs> <laughs> What? Apparently, it's his apparently he cleared. Is this all the like a cocaine joke? <laughs> no, like according to this map, Cuba survived whatever cataclysmic event, and you then mean started an it. Map? And then is this like from the movies or something? Like I don't, I don't know. I'm just. I didn't know there was an official map. Um, There's. I can't. The mo- I can't find an oh. official, but they yeah. uh, apparently in this snow cleared all of the people off of Cuba because if the island survived, the people wouldn't have died. Like, mm. Yeah. I mean, this, there's no like official map that like Suzanne Collins sanctioned, but the movies like made up their own map, but like some of it conflicts with like uh-huh. information from the books. Like in my brain, I really thought that the way, like until a couple years ago, I thought that the way that Panem worked was like, it was literally like a line. So it was like district one, then goes district two, then goes district three, then goes district four. <laughs> but like yes. upon yes. further reflection, I realize now it, that it, that's not possible. <laughs> the... Yeah. The map that I linked is a it's a fan made map, but the explanation so good though. Yeah, like, the the explanations. That's the one I go off of. Yeah, the explanations they give for like why they put things the way they did are it's actually really astute. Um, but yeah, it's like there's no like when you're reading the books, there's no fucking way to know where any of this shit is. Like <laughs> none whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, there's well, a little bit. I mean, you would know the twelve there's a in whole... Appalachia and a few yeah. things like that, yeah. but there's not. There's a whole bunch of them, and I like the ones that like have much of the uh, the continent is like underwater. So then it's like yeah. very limited landmass, yeah. and like that's part of why this has all happened. Yeah, well, like the one that Katie Link, they um, the authors like used some t- like National Geographic tool to like raise the sea level or whatever. And uh, apparently seven goes all the way up to like the Yukon territory and all through British Columbia, which I guess would make sense according to this fan map. But there's no snow island on it, so it's not real, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that I like is how, fake news. Oh, that's interesting how they did four. It's, yeah, uh, they based it on like there being shrimp and crab. Like they yeah. based it on like what the what their fishing is. Like apparently it's only like in the Gulf that you could do that. According yeah. to their like because, their... because well, four yeah, was like, definitely in the, the Gulf. Like because yeah, because yeah, like the that's the why the the like official map is wrong because like the movie map puts four on um like the west coast I think what? which was like made no sense. Yeah. No. So like, Finnick is clearly meant to be like get this oil off of my scrimps. Like he is. <laughs> <laughs> like he is meant to be a Cajun man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, no, the that map that Katie linked is like the one that I would go by, even if it's fan made. <laughs> um, okay, so part three is the peacekeeper where Snow is sent to District 12. Um, and we meet um, and then so Janice joins him later, and we meet, like, Billy Tope, who is Lucy Gray's ex-boyfriend, who's apparently dating the mayor's daughter, and uh, what things happen, so Janice gets involved with a rebellion or, like, a escape plot to go north, um, and Snow kills Mayfair and Billy Tope by, by accident, not really by accident, whatever, um, and 
decides to run away with Lucy Gray to the woods, but then realizes he doesn't have to because he found his murder weapons. And then he goes back to the capital and everything is great for him. And the 10th Hungry Games are erased from history <laughs> and things are good now. Also, the hanging tree is written. Yeah. <laughs> Did anyone, th- like, okay, the having the, hang- the hanging tree in there is fine. I think, like, having it and also the song that Katniss sings, Rue, like, that felt egregious. It's like, we don't need every song to have originated from this one girl <laughs> in the mountains. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, there's I only, didn't... like, three songs in the book, so. Mm. Yeah. I guess I just didn't like that there was a, I didn't want to know the origin to the hanging tree. Like, it's meant to be mysterious, you know? Yeah. I mean, I thought it was, like, in my brain, I always thought it was, like, a folk song that, like, had been yeah. carried down from, like, many generations, but it's, like, only three generations old. Yeah. So it was, like, yeah. Yeah. And I did like that they still had stuff from, like, from, like, our world that, like, Maud Ivory was seeing the Always Look on the Sunny Side. That made me happy. Yeah. I didn't like the... Speaking of things from, like, our world, when they, like, they're in, like, a car garage or something. Like, what the fuck happened to all of these things, you know? Like, did the Capitol just come and take away, like, their car? Because they had, like, I think there were some cars or something and, like, old relics. the mayor had a car. Yeah. Yeah. So did the... Did, when Snow became president, did he just be like, all right, like, we're getting rid of all of, like, tech things that could have existed, like, pre-dark days. Like, you guys now live in, like, cabins and... Well, it's been 10 years. Well, I would, They're I not making parts or before, gasoline anymore. Yeah, well, I would imagine that, like, before the rebellion, like, a lot of that had already kind of started to, to fizzle out naturally um, in some of these areas, but... I don't know. And and I will say like the singing of the songs in the audiobook was probably like the worst part. <laughs> oh, I the can way imagine. The, guy, yeah. the way the guy read them, I'm like, okay. That sounds awful. <laughs> this side I is mean, side. To be honest, I usually just kind of like skip over the song lyrics because I don't really care that much. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> the songs like, are yeah, good. when I'm reading, I'm like, I see it, it's fine. Move on. Like I know I get, she's singing. <laughs> I get it. I, I give them all the same really fast tune. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, could you do that for us, please? Um, it's like somehow they're all like, meet me down at the hanging tree. That's not right. So. The hanging tree one I have from the movie stuck in my like that's the one that I always think of for the hanging tree. And like, I don't know, it makes sense with like the what's that one song? Like the 15 hours and what da 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 da, like the one about coal mining and that song. Like, that's kind of just what I give the rest of it. Um, but okay, what did you guys think of Snow being sent to District 12? Like, I would have rather him gone to a different district so we could, like, get some more world building, yes. but I understand we have to have It would have been hard to meet Lucy connection. Gray. Yeah, fuck Anywhere that. else. Okay. Well, she, she didn't have to be from 12. She had to yeah, she's to not district, she could be anywhere. <laughs> right? <laughs> it did bother me that they did, she did District 12 again, and I don't know why that would be. Like, why wouldn't you pick a different one if you're going to explore your own world? Right, because it feels like it's, it's easy, you've already done this, you don't have to, you don't have to give us anything new. Like, so. At first, I was really excited because I thought they were going to District 9 because, like, that's where it opens or whatever in this part. And I was like, yes, like, we don't know anything about District 9. And so we, then I was really sad. Do we even know what industry they're supposed yeah. to be? Um, I think they, they was, probably like, told green. us. <laughs> I think it's green. Uh, yeah, I think that might be fan speculation also. Here's it, like, I don't mind it, her being from 12 again. Sorry, I can hear myself. Um, I don't mind her being from 12 again if there was some sort of like, like, that this fucks him up and like, it makes him more paranoid towards Katniss later. Like, if there's enough of a resemblance to Katniss that like it, like it influences his later attitudes towards her and makes her more, right. like, but he that, make, is it, kind, that is kind of implied with like the Maude Ivory, like knowing all the songs and probably being Katniss's grandma and teaching them to her dad who teaches, like, it's it kind of like implied. But that's like trivia. That's like it just yeah. this kid happens to be a grandmother. I meant more like that. There's enough of a resonance beneath, between these two characters that like so we can understand that 65 years later he would understand the implicit threat of somebody like who is this charismatic and you know has the potential to like draw p- like other people towards her. But there's none of that there. It just seems like uh, I don't know that Susan Collins is really attached to District 12. <laughs> yeah. It, 
I don't know. They've had charismatic winners before. Like that Finn guy was very charismatic. That Finn guy. Finnick. Put some respect on Finnick's name. Put some respect on his name. Finnick is literally my favorite character. Please watch yourself. I'm just saying that he was very well liked. He was very charismatic. Sure. But he wasn't. But but he wasn't a rebel either. I guess yeah. he was in the end. But he wasn't. Like, he, he was. He. He died so that Annie could live. <laughs> right. Anyway. <laughs> sort of. I mean, like, he didn't have to go, but... <laughs> Is okay. that how you stop, you read it? You're like, you didn't have to go. <laughs> literally, I was like, I was like, dude, you didn't have to go. Like, you literally didn't have to go. <laughs> you definitely Mom. turned on the murder machine in that book. Like, she was like, I'll just kill basically everybody. <laughs> Man, I do, I hate when stories do that where it's like they start out as a band of people and then it's just everyone sacrifices themselves for the main character yeah so. i'm like yeah, Candace sometimes didn't that have to fun. live like finnick sacrificed himself so that everyone else could live and i was like who gives a shit how about Candace you? anymore like how, how dare you how dare <laughs> you was like i felt dis- so Just disturbed by that when i was reading it was like because i think he was my favorite character too and like more than anybody else getting ripped to shreds like that was just so disturbing of like for he fuck's just sake, deserved- the ladder, the ladder. <laughs> he deserved so much more like he literally he, he could have gone out a better so- way but also like, he-, he just like he was kind of like Peta. Like he was so mentally broken that. No, but then he got. Oh, he got back, fixed. So it was okay. <laughs> like, what are you saying, Kevin? That like he deserved death because he had like PTSD. <laughs> no, I'm just saying like at a certain point in story time, people with PTSD like, like like deserve Theon. to die. <laughs> it's like Theon. Like, yeah, Kevin, what Kevin, look, when you have, do if he survived a song of ice like and that, fire, you should live. <laughs> Yeah, if what, it, so he Dollar exhausted Store, his usefulness. He's Dollar Store James Franco in the movies. All right, I'm not trying to hear it. <laughs> Kill him. Move on. The movie makes it so much worse where he's screaming for Jennifer Lawrence to save him, and she just drops a bomb on him. <laughs> <laughs> she did what she could. Listen, there is a reason I haven't rewatched Mockingjay Part Two since I saw it in theaters. Okay, I just don't want to relive that scene. <laughs> um, the part where people get vaporized. Does anyone have? Yeah. Um, does anyone have anything else to say about part three? Because I feel like we talked a lot about it like before we actually got to the section breakdowns. Um, One thing is I really like the Jabberjay concept um, in the story. Like it makes sense that like some military like think tank would be like, yeah, this is a totally like efficient way to spy on people because if you kill like a bird, like there's no recording. And but obviously like as any like any like investigation into military history like using animals usually like blows up in your face in some way dolphins <laughs> spy yeah. dolphins but the Jabber think... is cool that like they have like ways of like turning like putting them in neutral state and then like making them record stuff by sending them signals like i i enjoyed that the explanation of like their their like physiology or i guess like their bio their function the only thing i had with that like was we already knew all of that based like we like didn't know the minute detail but like it was it Katniss like explains the Jabber Jays in um sorry someone's doing dishes in my house if you can hear them sorry um Katniss like explains the Jabber Jays in Catching Fire so it's like we already kind of knew it and then she just rehashes the information to like remind us so I don't know and also just freaking the mocking Jays like okay we get it <laughs> yeah it's very over overwrought I think it's a fine concept but it's just overdone in the book so did you guys think that that Lucy Gray was on to him at the end? Or like I didn't think until he started shooting at her that she was I mean, she hit a snake in her Did she do that? The snake yeah, I think. I think, like, I think that was intentional. I think when it wasn't poison. It, it seemed like was she was hiding from him. Mint. I don't know. I thought it was just a random snake that happened to bite him and then he was like, oh, I don't shit, think he's trying to kill me. I mean, like, where the fuck yeah, would she have gone? Like, why would she have like run away from him? If she, she didn't, did take it he said he killed left. three people, bro. Yeah, he gave, like he I gave the game away. It was a classic. It was a classic uh, villain misstep. Like, yeah. How do you Monologue. how do you know what color that room was? I never told you. Oh no. Yeah, but like, where the fuck did she go? Did she just like disappear into the she woods and died of bird? She died she, of exposure. It's just like her song. She. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, no, I think she was like she kind of realized that she was with a man that would probably end up turning on her for one reason or another and just got the fuck out of there. And then if probably only, died of exposure. 
If only she had like had it had been foreshadowed in any way that she distrusted him. Because up until then she seemed like perfectly fine with like <laughs> with everything that he was saying and doing and suddenly like he slips up and she's like, Oh god, this man might murder me like like after watching him murder like Mayfair and I know Billy Tope, like, oh they, they, this man is capable of killing and like being told yeah, that he killed I, that boy I from think, eight. I think that like when he showed up again in twelve, you know, she's like very sly and rolls with it and is like, Oh, it's great to see you but the whole time she's like, I gotta figure out a way to get out of this. Like that's the yeah, I think, think I'll be... Do you think she was really planning on running away with Billy Tote? At what point in time? Well, he says that she was his girlfriend and was going to run away with him. I don't know. He seemed kind of dishonest. And then Mayfair <laughs> showed up. Well, yeah. But then Mayfair showed up and was like, what the fuck? And he's like, oh, no, you're not supposed to be here. Yeah, I think yeah. that's what... I have to, I'd have to look at her song again, but I think there's some something that might imply that that actually was a real thing until... Yeah, like, I think okay. most of the Covey were like, not most of the Covey, but, like, I think, like, she was part of, like, a group that was, like, planning on heading north, like, and then she got picked for the Hunger Games and was like, well, never mind, and then the opportunity kind of came back, and she was like, yep, okay, I'm back on this. Yeah, so I think the only thing that justifies for me the lack of suspicion on her part is just, again, the way that, that uh, Coriolanus is seeing the world, where he just can't see any of that. Like, he is, like, incapable of seeing the distrust. I don't know about that. Like, he almost inherently distrusts people well, yeah, like, but I, he rationalizes I, in her case at least like that she loves him so okay. much like well, I, yeah I, and, I don't, I don't in know. his brain either she it she loves him or she's playing him like there is no yeah i don't think he understands the concept of like she might love him but not be sure or be you know Andy. i don't, I don't yeah. think he's he's like, because he has some of those feelings himself, but he doesn't seem able to project that onto other yeah, people. Because he's like, she's either like entirely mine or like yeah. not. Like, it's like there's no room for nuance. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, well, so... I heard a theory on Twitter that um, some people think that Lucy Gray is still alive and goes away to District 13, and President Coyne is related to her maybe her daughter for example oh yeah I've, i have heard that one actually i did read that um yeah, yeah i mean that's it's what possible. i was wondering it's like because if she goes north that's 13 right mm-hmm. yeah so one of my my favorite scenes to watch i don't know why i like watching this so much i love watching the part where president coin dies I, just found <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that i watched the... <laughs> watch all the, the drums and, and like, stuff yes. it's a fun scene <laughs> it's oh. like so dark like i said i just watched those movies recently and the fact that she is prepared to take a cyanide tablet immediately after she does it i was like this is like really grim yeah. they go really maybe dark. i should well the whole thing was pretty Mark dark Jay part two the, the whole idea of it like they're just going to create the same thing over again only with the other side on top it yeah. is pretty dark in itself yeah they're it's like still- yeah we just need to have like a revenge hunger games and everything will be cool it's like <laughs> what yeah <laughs> And also, Joanna was, like, totally on board with it. She's like, yeah, let's do it. I mean, <laughs> would you expect anything less? I love Joanna. She's I love Joanna favorite. so much. She was the best. Um, oh, I, like, I love how she was the What's going on? Well, Finnick is the best, but also I like Joanna. I'm allowed to like more than one character. No, Zach said Zach said. I didn't say Finnick was the best. I never said that. Oh, you no. didn't? Yeah. Are you sure, Zach? I'm sure. You can check okay. the record. <laughs> Like, I will go down, um, like, saying Finnick was the best. Like, I'll take that to my grave, but I also like Joanna. Yeah. I actually like Katniss. I mean, if oh, I, do sure. I love Katniss. I'm with she's Zach. So really like no. yeah. She's so annoying. No. She's supposed to be annoying, but, like, ugh. I don't think, I think, I think she thing, was... The only thing I don't like about her are, like, the, like, I don't really, I'm not really interested in either of these boys, but, like, yeah. I think I'm in love, but I don't know. But Yeah, th- well, that's, like, why I don't like her, because I'm, like, It doesn't girl... actually seem to fit her character. Yeah, I'm, like, girl, you part. can focus on other things. Like, you, these boys, like, fuck them. Go be yourself, and, like, go, go fuck these boys. Like, not go fuck these boys. Like <laughs> <laughs> It's okay, I think Wait you said second. enough. She, uh, <laughs> she's a character. She can yeah, do it. We don't have to go into that too much, but... I, I think she actually... Yeah. Had feelings for Gail. I think Peter was more like just a brother type. No, of thing I think to her. she had feelings. For, I think she legitimately had feelings for both, and like I understood that that confusion. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah, it's too. Um, it's like who do I like more? Like my childhood friend, or the or the person I went to war with? You know. 
two different relationships. And the person who's like done everything for me and loves me unconditionally and understands my pain way more yeah. than you know Gail did. So, but um, Gail is also Liam Hemsworth, so I understand. Like, yes, <laughs> I mean, Valid. he is a lesser Hemsworth, but still. Yeah. Um. Okay. Just like going back to, I just have like two more things that I wanted to talk about for like this podcast. Um. So like going back to the book. Um. Would you guys like want to see another sequel, like a sequel to this book, like about no. Snow's Rise to Power, or like another prequel about like a different time period from? Hey, so here's what I'll say: is I'd I really prequel, the... prequel. Sorry, so, what? So I'll say quickly, like the thing I would be interested in seeing, and there needs to be more in a book to justify its creation. But I really do; I am interested in seeing how the games evolve over time. Like yeah. that is that's a cool idea to me to see how it becomes this reality TV show. Like, I, like I, Hamish's like, games or something. I think it'd be I cool love, if she did. Yeah, if she did like a bunch of the other characters. Like she had like a book that was like their like you know their game. So it was like we see like Hamish, Finnick, Joanna, like all that you know like that. Just might like be short cool. stories. Yeah, that would be something so like that. Dark. Like just, or you know what? In this, I want to see how they all, like, why they're all traumatized twenty years every, later, yeah. and like they've got Hunger Games again, and Katniss is like, "I'm still dealing with this shit." Are you kidding? Uh, uh, yeah. No, I'm past that. She already had like kids and whatever. No like we got her epilogue. So oh, the yeah, that's true. the snow epilogue makes it seem like he just pretty much thought of everything that made the games good, which is kind of annoying to be honest. It, it makes it makes some sense though. I mean, he probably he would have been one of the people in control for most of his life. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it, the implication is that he is basically the reason why the Capitol has this ascendance back to being yeah. amazing. So, I don't know. Yeah, I honestly don't know, like, how much more, like, what other st- like, obviously, like, I like this world, I like these stories, but I feel like the story about, like, the world is not bigger, is not bigger, broad enough for there to be much more than like, the history of the rebellion, pretty much. Um, I honestly yeah, don't yeah, I don't know, like, what other stories you would be able to tell, but I also feel like if she did write another book on this world, like, like this novel to me felt like a first pass novel, like, this very much felt like a first draft that should, Agreed. like, an like an editor would have gone back and been like, okay, tighten up the conflict here, make some more tension here, um... It, but I feel like she's also Suzanne Collins, and so like if she turns That's, in a yeah. manuscript, yeah, the publishing house is like, like yeah, Ch-ch-ch-ch. all right, <laughs> who cares? And it doesn't it's, matter. It's twenty twenty, y'all, and uh, editors are kind of busy. Yeah, <laughs> I would. I guess if I'm interested in anything, it is like what ha- what happened like to create whatever the Civil War was or whatever happened. Like, I'm interested in what that was. Yeah, but I'm not like I've seen the Hunger Games. I get it. I, I don't know as if that's that interesting to me anymore. Like this one just went by. I was like, whatever. Yeah. Well, I thought originally uh, I, I thought that that's what this book was going to be. It was going to be about so the I. dark days. And I thought the dark days meant like the rebellion, but I don't know. I'm happy well, for the world the building that I got. Say that it gives you like, you know, the details of like the 10 years of the, you know, the dark days and what happened to the rebellion and all that, but it didn't really give you that much. And I kind of feel what? like a world, a world book is what we want. Like, Give me, oh, I like, don't. I don't. I don't want a world book. <laughs> well, no, 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 not like, not like. I like I stories. Own, I don't like. I, I own a fan. Like I own a fan-made Hunger Games like, world book. Details. We don't necessarily need um, like a whole other novel to just like give us exposition. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I would say I'm interested in like the world before the rebellion. Like, what was the relationship of the districts and the capital before? And then the the rebellion itself, but that's probably about it. I don't want to read, I don't want to read, you know, eight other different Hunger Games and how they happened and like because at that point it's just like, all right, how did all these kids die and this person <laughs> won and they drank a bunch afterwards because it was the most traumatic thing yeah. you could possibly imagine. At that point, you're just doing research for the real Hunger Games. Yeah, <laughs> I Which, would, you know, like, we're, give it a year or two, we'll be there. I would like a list of just like how each tribute won each of the games like who they were what their names were that's like that's like the only like interest i have anymore in this world is like trivia that can go on the wiki <laughs> like <laughs> and i mean i guess too i wouldn't mind seeing like stories in other districts if there's like little rebellions that might be interesting and how people you know then the whole time you're wondering if those rebels make it to district 13 or not that might be all right are we feeling we- about the possible movie they're out. making a movie of this? Yeah, they plan to. Oh, yeah, I was curious. Is, is that a thing? 
before the book was released, uh, Lionsgate released a press release saying that they're working with Suzanne Collins, they're going to do another movie, and I'm guessing it will be based on this story. I mean, yeah. in my brain, no movies well, are being made, no media is being made right now. So. <laughs> That's a lie. Um, do, yeah, you, think... do you guys remember the theme park that they were going to do? I don't know if that's still on. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> what does that look like? <laughs> There's like, Who's sending like their I don't know if it's that? like part of a land at Universal Studios or, or I forget what it was, but they were talking about um, like a potential, like, you know, Amusement park right, centered so around the rides? The games universe. <laughs> Let's this out. Ride a coal car down into the mines. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's like, like this the... book felt like a cash grab to me, so a movie would also feel that way. So. See, well, see yeah. that's actually what I thought. I was like, is this saying Colin's coming on hard times? Like, I. Well, she hasn't re- published. I was looking at her like, um, like Goodreads profile, and she like hasn't published anything in a really long time. So nor did she have to. I'm not so blaming her. I actually don't blame. I don't actually blame her. I think it's exactly what Katie said. We're like, I think she just wanted to write a book, but no, there was no oversight on making it a good book because no one yeah, cared because no. it would make money. Like yeah, that was like, the problem. So like, I mean, like I, I, I said I liked the book, and like I'm happy I got it. Like it was fun to read, and like it didn't make me think super hard. Like it was YA. Like. <laughs> Like it, it made me reread the Hunger Games series again, which I liked. So, you know, it's got a sick cover. <laughs> it's got, yeah, what sick, is, it's got what too is, long a title. What do you make so of you, What do you make of the title, "The Ballad of Snakes and Songbirds"? Like, what is the thematic significance of, of well, this title? Well, we've got snakes, we have songbirds, we have ballads. So, <sighs> yeah, <laughs> that's case closed. The, yeah, <laughs> the weird part is, is she kind of represents them both. Snakes and songbirds. Yeah, I mean, I think the the basic interpretation, right, is that she's a songbird and he's a snake. Yeah, yeah. but but it's she's also very snaky. Yeah, <laughs> she likes but, snakes. Well, she knows where to find them. But that felt so shallow. She found one in the Capitol. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It wasn't really developed. <laughs> I wonder if there's some stuff in here that's supposed to be like you're supposed to get, and I don't get it. Like she's alluding to something that I don't understand, and that's why like Lucy Gray's thing would make more sense if I just was a more critical reader or something. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I feel hope like not. I need some. I feel like I need some <laughs> footnotes for like the songs because like some of them I was like, oh, like like they. Had, you should like, just read like... them. It would probably <laughs> be better. Well, okay, I like it's not like I didn't read them, but I just like skimmed them. So it's like some of them I was like, oh, like that's the like oh my darling Clementine song and stuff, and I was like. And, like, some of them I was, like, did she make these, like, what are they based on, you know? Like, maybe, like, I need someone to tell me, like, oh, this is based on this literary, you know, this great piece of literature that I'm ignorant of because, you know, like, I'm a savage or something. You know, like, something that, like, you know, if I had, like, an English degree, I'd be like, oh, I I understand. Like, this is a reference to Lord Byron. And it's like, da 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 you know. Or, yeah. <laughs> no. no. Tear out okay. the pages of your books. AKA, I want my English desk. degree roommate to read this book so she can tell me um, if any of these po- songs are <laughs> references. Well, I mean, I have an English degree, and I can tell you that I think this stuff is surface deep. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, that's all I have. Um, yeah, so thanks for joining me. I hope that I was an okay host. <laughs> you did well, Abby. Thank you. The conversation flowed. Thank you for hosting. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, that's it. I don't know. <laughs> <Peace> <laughs> <out>. <laughs> yeah. How do we? How do we leave? Uh, something. Something. I don't know. Oh, wait. How do we leave this arena? Yeah. yeah. All hey, right. We, oh. About... Only one of us can leave. Did we? <laughs> <laughs>